has been, he's our next reader, that's why we're talking about him, has been the chair of the National Society of Film Critics since 2005. He's also the chief book critic of Film Quarterly, and he becomes editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Books and Video in uh, January. The Beats, a very short introduction, is published by Oxford University Press in its popular Very Short Introduction series. This is David's third book on the Beat Generation. The first was Mad to be Saved, The Beats in the 50s, and Film in 1998, and the second, oh, Beats in the 50s and Film in 1998. Um, and the second was Screening the Beats, Media Culture and the Beat Sensibility in 2004, both from Southern Illinois University Press. He teaches at MICA, and at Columbia University, and he's on the editorial board of the Journal of Beat Studies. Thank you very much, David Sterrett. Well, thank you, John and Deborah, for this lovely invitation to uh, to read here. And um, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I was going to read. I am going to read uh, a portion from this book about the beats that I just this third one that I just did, uh, published. But um, the, the part I want to read is kind of short, so I thought I would supplement it with some stuff from a recent magazine article that I did um, on that kind of just kind of flesh it out. Uh, this is the shortest book I've ever written and I think it's one of the shortest books anybody has ever written, uh, except that Oxford University Press has this series called Very Short Introductions, and uh, they are very short. That's kind of the point. So a book like this kind of unfolds in little sections like this. So to do kind of a sustained reading is a little bit tricky. So that is why I've settled on this hybrid approach. Uh, but I hope it will go reasonably smoothly. I was going to bring along some music to play, but um, I forgot. And maybe it's just as well, but no. You did a bang up job, John. That was full of suspense. So, uh, so okay. And here's what I've decided to do. I'm going to kind of focus on some of the recent movies about the Beat Generation uh, that, that have come out. Because first of all, I've been a film critic for like many decades. Uh, and secondly, because uh, there have been a, kind of a spate, or has been kind of a spate of, of Beat Generation movies just in the past couple of years or so. Um, for decades before that, uh, there was uh, not very much to boast of in, in, in the treatment of, of the Beat Generation on film. Um, and I might have to remove my glasses a bit because it is kind of dark up here. But um, uh, there have been movies uh, such as, well, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. Some of us remember Maynard G. Krebs, the beatnik. Okay, that's, uh, that's an example of how the movies have traditionally treated the beats. Uh, a Bucket of Blood, uh, entertaining but scruffy horror movie from the 50s. Um, uh, Randall McDougall's uh, no adaptation of Jack Kerouac's novel, The Subterraneans. Uh, which is kind of an interesting movie, although it takes the African-American heroine of Kerouac's novel and makes her into Leslie Caron, which is a, a, a really a, a magical switch. Uh, and, and others, David Cronenberg's lumbering version of Naked Lunch, etc. But there have been uh, some recent uh, movies about the B generation that have fared at least somewhat better. And the first of this recent crop to arrive, and I'm now turning a little bit to this article I did recently in Cineast, magazine uh, about beat movies. Uh, the first to arrive was a movie called Howl. Uh, obviously, for many of us, it's obvious, uh, the name of Allen Ginsberg's most famous poem. Uh, and this movie was directed by the team of Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman. Uh, and it came out just a few years ago, and it's kind of a docudrama uh, in which James Franco plays Allen Ginsberg. Alan changed over the years. He didn't always look like James Franco. Uh, and, but he did, according to this movie, when he was young. Uh, and it, it, it's kind of a, of, of, of a docudrama about the trial, mainly, uh, of Howell for being obscene, and the publisher, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, City Lights Books, uh, who were brought up on charges. And then the whole thing was declared not obscene, and it was kind of a landmark case. William S. Burroughs's novel, Naked Lunch, provided a similar landmark case uh, uh, dealing with uh, a slightly different corner of the law. So that was the first of these recent movies to come out, and, and having said that, 
that. Uh, I'm going to move now to another movie that involves Allen Ginsberg and pretty much all the important members, well, key members of the Beat Generation. Uh, and it's a movie called Kill Your Darlings. Uh, and it's based on kind of a little known story, uh, something, not a story, but something that really happened way back when the Beat Circle was just beginning to form back in 1944, uh, largely but not entirely around Columbia University. And um, this incident, which has been a little known, I, I wrote a section about it in this book, which I'll get to in a moment. And it's still little known because nobody went to see this movie uh, that came out about it. But it's not a, not, not a bad film. It's called Kill Your Darlings, uh, directed by a new filmmaker named John Krokitis. Uh, so um, in this movie, uh, Allen Ginsberg, again, you know, if any of you can picture Allen Ginsberg, you'd probably do the way I usually do. Now, I mean, I met him back in the 60s uh, when he was young, but you know, over the, he had this hair all over the place, and he also he was bald, uh, and was just a, a generally sort of a scruffy looking fellow, uh, but there he is, he's James Franco in one movie, and in this movie, Kill Your Darlings, he is played by Daniel Radcliffe, uh, hitherto known as the star of the Harry Potter movies. So uh, Alan has done very well posthumously uh, in, in his being treated in the movies. And um, the, the, the screenplay takes its cue uh, from a mournful episode in early beat history. And now I will switch over to uh, my little book here. Um, involving a couple of guys named Carr and Kammerer. Uh, in 1944, an event took place that troubled Jack Kerouac, as well as William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg, helping to catalyze the unhappy outlook on life that characterizes some early beat writing. The main players in this tragedy were Lucian Carr and David Kammerer. Uh, and by the way, in the movie, uh, most, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, okay. Still on this. Uh, Kammerer had been a friend of Burroughs since childhood, and in 1933 they had visited Europe together. Uh, Burroughs found Kammerer, quote, always very funny, the veritable life of the party, and completely without any middle class morality. Uh, Kammerer became an instructor at Washington University in St. Louis, and he also ran a youth group that this much younger guy, David Carr, joined while he was still a boy. By all reports, Kammerer was infatuated and then obsessed with this boy named David Carr. Uh, and uh, as, Carr, um, as Carr grew older, uh, he became a Columbia student and he, was, uh, he came from a family that had a lot of money. Uh, and uh, in his last published novel, Kerouac's novel, uh, Vanity of Deloise, uh, he described uh, the, the, the uh, character based on Carr as being a young man of fantastic male beauty, actually like Oscar Wilde's model male heroes. They traveled to Mexico together in 1940, Kammerer and Carr did, uh, with permission from Carr's mother. But after she found some of Kammerer's letters, the shocked mother worked hard to keep them apart. Kammerer then followed Carr to each of several schools he enrolled in. Carr evidently had no interest in a homosexual relationship, but he appeared to enjoy the attention that his older friend lavished on him, especially when the former English teacher wrote his college homework for him. Carr transferred to Columbia in 1943 with Kammerer and Burroughs trailing along. Soon Kammerer met Ginsburg and Kerouac, becoming part of the fledgling beat circle. Kammerer and Carr were an odd couple with a penchant for trouble, ranging from childish horseplay to deep emotional crises. An instance of the latter arose in 1943 when Carr landed in a mental institution after an apparent suicide attempt. Yeah, that's the younger man. The already unstable mood of their friendship took another downturn when Carr, the younger man, fell in love with a young woman. Kammerer stalked Carr on some days and refused to see him on others. The tension between them finally exploded on a summer night in 1944. Kammerer had been hunting for Carr that evening, eventually finding him drunk in the West End, a bar in the Columbia neighborhood. They left the bar together, and later in the night they came to blows on a hillside not far away. According to an account by Ted Morgan, who's a very major beat biographer, Carr then went to the apartment that Burroughs was sharing with Kerouac and Kerouac's girlfriend, Edie Parker, telling them what had happened next and throwing Kammerer's eyeglasses onto the table. I just got rid of the old man, Carr said. I stabbed him in the heart with my Boy Scout knife. Kerouac asked why. Carr answered, 
He jumped me. He said, I love you and all that stuff and couldn't live without me. He added that Kammerer had threatened to kill both him and his girlfriend. After stabbing Kammerer, the young man had tied stones onto the body's arms and legs using strips torn from the shirt. Then he had pushed Kammerer's body into the Hudson River where it hovered until Carr waded in up to his chin and pushed it into the current. So now Carr, after this, comes back to this apartment uh, where Burroughs, uh, Kerouac, and Kerouac's girlfriend are living. Burroughs, who one thinks of, I certainly think of, as the baddest bad boy of the Beats, Burroughs advised Carr to turn himself in and make a plea of self-defense. But Kerouac took a very different tack. He went with Carr to the scene of the crime, where Carr buried the incriminating glasses and dropped his knife into a sewer. This is uncannily reminiscent of the famous Leopold and Loeb murder case, which also involved incriminating uh, glasses uh, and has been ins inspired more than one major work in the media. Uh, then, after uh, burying the glasses and dropping the knife into a sewer, uh, Kerouac and Carr went for drinks and a movie. Um, two days later, Carr then took Burroughs' advice and surrendered to the police, reaching a plea bargain that reduced a possible 20-year sentence to two years of actual time served and it placed him in a reformatory rather than a penitentiary. He left the, mature, the reformatory a changed man, so eager for a conventional life that when Ginsburg later dedicated his great poem Howl to him, he didn't like it, he complained and wanted his name removed. Burroughs and Kerouac considered, were, were considered material witnesses to the crime and they were arrested for not reporting it. Burroughs, you know, he came from the Burroughs adding machine family. His family was loaded with money, some of which they spent keeping him at a distance. Um, so uh, his family bailed him out immediately. Kerouac's humiliated father refused to follow suit, so Edie Parker, Kerouac's girlfriend, put up the money on the condition that Kerouac marry her. <laughs> so much for the freewheeling morality of the, uh, of the Beats back in those days, and he did. Uh, Ginsburg was not hauled into the legal system, but he was deeply shocked by what had happened, fearing it was a horrific consequence of the morbidly tinged romanticism in which he and his friends had indulged. Um, yeah, uh, so Ginsburg uh, started a novel based on the incident called The Blood Song, which he never finished. Kerouac also wrote about the tragedy in a novella called I Wish I Were You, which also went unfinished. Uh, Kerouac later wove this whole thing into his first novel, The Town and the City, and wove it again into his last novel, Vanity of Dulois. Uh, in its immediate aftermath, Kerouac and Burroughs used it as the basis for their attempt at a joint novel, and the hippos were boiled in their tanks, writing under pseudonyms and borrowing their title from a news report about a circus fire. They found an agent, but nobody would publish it. So, uh, that is the story that is told in uh, this recent movie, Kill Your Darlings, uh, which has Daniel Radcliffe as, uh, as, as, as Allen Ginsberg, and uh, Dan DeHaan as Lucian Carr, and interestingly, as a camera, the older man, um, who was really the, the, the more dangerous part of this duo, uh, Michael C. Hall of uh, Six Feet Under and Dexter fame. Uh, and he gives really a very good performance in it. He's quite a versatile, uh, versatile actor. Uh, so with that said, I thought I would turn to just one more of the recent Beat movies because it's based on one of the most famous uh, of all Beat works, along with Hal, probably the most famous, which is Kerouac's novel On the Road, which was not his first novel, but which, uh, and which was not published until quite a few years, about a half a dozen years after he finished it. But then it got this rave review in the New York Times and really launched him to, to, to tremendous fame uh, and um, also uh, launched his friends to somewhat to, to, to a good deal of fame and help them get get works published as well uh, so uh, Kerouac's uh, days as a Columbia student uh, were several years behind him when he started to write on the road first as a conventional novel and then as a work of jazz like spontaneous prose he had, uh, Kerouac had loved movies all his life, by the way. Uh, he, he, he once recalled seeing uh, the Walt Disney film Fantasia 15 times. Uh, and when On the Road was published, uh, Kerouac quickly imagined a screen version, uh, deciding that he should play the main character, Sal Paradise, himself, opposite Marlon Brando as Dean Moriarty, the other main character. He wrote to Brando. Brando did not write back. Uh, 
Um, so, there the matter lay until 1980, 11 years after Kerouac had died, when Francis Ford Coppola acquired the movie rights. Among the many writers Coppola engaged to write the screenplay were such notables as Michael Hare, Barry Gifford, Russell Banks, and himself. Uh, none of the drafts, however, were satisfactory. Uh, after, then Walter Salas in 2004 uh, released a movie called The Motorcycle Diaries, which was about the young Che Guevara, played by Gail Garcia Bernal, uh, tooling through South America with a friend. And after seeing that movie, Coppola hired Walter Salas and the screenwriter Jose Rivera to make the Kerouac project happen at last, and it did. Uh, Salas and Rivera deserve applause for simply getting the picture finished and made, and their adaptation is moderately true to the novel's basic structure, following Sal, who is the Kerouac character, and Dean, who is the, um, the um, um, Neil Cassidy character, on a series of, of journeys, stopovers, and visits that take them to such far-flung locations as Denver, San Francisco, North Carolina, a California cotton field, a Mexican brothel, a modest Queens apartment, and an upscale Manhattan neighborhood, picking up and dropping off a variety of friends, acquaintances, and relatives along the way. Now, the main characters are played by Sam Riley and Garrett Hedlund. Unfortunately, Kerouac was dead and Marlon Brando still wasn't interested. Actually, he's dead too. Uh, so, uh, so we ended up with Sam Riley and Garrett Hedlund, and uh, they are both less than dynamic uh, as the lead characters, but they are consistently appealing and there's a good uh, supporting cast, including a number of women, including uh, Kristen uh, Stewart and, and Kirsten Dunst and Amy Adams and Elizabeth Moss, uh, who play wives and girlfriends coping the best they can with the shamelessly male chauvinist beat guys. Um, these things said, what's missing from On the Road is the novel's deep investment not just in movement and travel, but also in the incessant compulsive curiosity about people, places, and things that propels Sal on his voyages and energizes every page of Kerouac's hyperactive prose. The novel's psychological perceptions are also diminished, most notably at the end of the movie. And I'm, I'm going to skip that bit. Uh, since the movie was made so long after the publication of On the Road, I wish Salas and Rivera had been emboldened to include some of the biographical facts that Kerouac left out of his very autobiographical novel. Sex scenes recur in the movie as regularly as they would in a summertime sex pick or teen pick. Uh, but unlike the real Kerouac, Sal always leaves the room when a male partner beckons. Uh, and from watching the movie, you'd never know that Kerouac, the author of On the Road, hated hitchhiking, uh, that he had a truly weird relationship with his truly weird mother, or that he was well on his way to alcoholism even before the period of On the Road. Uh, Kerouac was a more fascinating figure than his famous novel reveals, uh, and I wish that more of his full complexity had been put into the movie. I want to just end with a little sort of epilogue here about one more beat movie, which is actually very recent, which is actually the best of them all. And since these are all available, like on DVD, I recommend you check them out. Especially this one, Big Sur, uh, named after the place in California and based on uh, Kerouac's novel of that title. Uh, and Big Sur, B Big Sur, the movie, uh, begins with a slightly altered passage uh, from Kerouac's novel, which was published in 1962. So this is a quote from Kerouac, just a few years after On the Road was published. All over America, high school and college kids thinking, Jack Kerouac is 26 years old and on the road all the time hitchhiking, while well, here I am, almost 40 years old, bored and jaded. That's the Kerouac who we see in this movie, which is directed by Michael Polish. He's a middle-aged alcoholic, sickened by three years of unsought fame as King of the Beatniks. Now realizing that he is surrounded and outnumbered and has to get away to solitude again or die. That's what Kerouac wrote in the novel, and that's in the movie. Uh, his friend Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, offers him the use of his isolated cabin in Northern California. So Kerouac boards a train from New York, has a final misbegotten bender in San Francisco, and finally settles down for a healing, restorative sojourn in the wild. Quote again, no booze, no drugs, no binges, no bouts with beatniks and drunks and junkies and everybody. That's what he says, and in their place are nature, books, and contemplation. On the fourth day, in both the novel and the film, Kerouac realizes 
with amazement that he is bored and jaded again. So he hightails it out of there, eager for more, why no yelling with the gang in San Francisco. Now, during both the novel and the movie, Kerouac returns to Big Sur, first with a gang of writer friends, and later with his friend Neil Cassidy's lover, uh, with whom he's having an affair. Uh, interludes with other beats and fellow travelers occur between the cabin episodes, but at the climax, he's back in the woods, ravaged by delirium tremens and paranoid hallucinations in which everything is death. In the film's last moments, same as in the novel, he has a glowing vision of transcendence, peace, and joy, complete with a Christian cross shining before his eyes. But it's obviously a self-deluding mirage that would seem pathetic, even if you didn't know that his real-life counterpart, the real Kerouac, died an alcoholic's hemorrhagic death a few short years later. Simple golden eternity, blessing all, he tells himself. Nothing ever happened, not even this. Cold comfort. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>